Thank you. And you had a comment. Oh. Oh. Thank you. My name is Jorge Salazar. I come from Colombia. I came here like 11 years ago as a refugee. Thank you to everybody who organized the event. Joanna for giving me the word. Um, I have a couple, uh, two or three reflections, and they come with a couple of questions. Um, and I'll be quick. I do have notes to make sure that they go short. Um, the first one, I think, goes for Professor James. Uh, a couple of comments. One was that when you were explaining the cycle of conflict, the, the conflict cycle, you mentioned, uh, you were talking about all the different processes that go through in terms of conflict. Um, you mentioned some stuff, uh, and you went even all the way to reconciliation and transformation, but there was no comment, or I, don't, I didn't see it, maybe I missed it, about justice. And, 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 and in, in, uh, for some of us, uh, some of us that uh, come from communities that have been affected by war or conflict, justice is a big, big chunk of the conversation and the process that we have to go through. Sometimes conflict is the cause of the conflict. Sorry, so sometimes uh, justice is the cause of the, uh, demanding justice is the cause of the conflict or the cause of why some of us have to leave. Uh, sometimes, uh, so very interested about why that wasn't that uh, visible in the, in, the, in the cycle, because I think, I mean, maybe that's something that to reflect on. And the second thing that I think, although I agree uh, that some of us as communities, I, I was curious about the challenges that we as, as, as communities, uh, diaspora communities co um, have challenges of being divided, competing, et cetera, et cetera. I think, um, it is even more important to acknowledge that we as communities of diaspora, we have, or at least in my case, I, I, I cannot speak on behalf of all communities, but our realities in the north are very problematic. Like our, I mean, we, some of us come from being marginalized back home to come to North America to be marginalized in North America. And, um, and some of the communities that, that I'm working with, and, and, and I ended up, I, I, I would not be the, the, the Colombian who can complain that much about going through that much marginalization, because although I did every immigrant job that you can do, or you, every immigrant job, like dishwashing, the construction, digging holes, carrying steel, like I did them all. Uh, I, I was able to navigate the system, and I did well. But I ended up being the only person of color sitting in boards with, I was the only person of color, like, and the rest of people around me were white people with PhDs, and that was, that was my reality, and I, I ended up saying, well, okay, uh, I'm speaking, and I somehow ended up speaking the language. So I got along, and I met a good friends, uh, was able to, I think I achieved quite a bit, but then I realized I was the only one. And not, just, and not because I navigated the system meant that, so, that the Canadian society was welcoming, welcoming me, it meant that I was able to mold myself to, to Canadian society, but most of my community, I mean, they, I have friends, and uh, they're 20, 30 years in Canada who were amazing activists, leaders in their communities back home in South America, from Chile, Argentina, Colombia, Guatemala. Today, they're cleaning houses or, or, or in construction after two, th 20, 30 years. So I think, yes, um, in, within our communities, we have challenges of being divided or we have challenges of, of competing for resources because they're scarce. But I think the reality of, of that we are being placed is, is drastic. And uh, there is issues of magistration. So here are my questions. So the questions to Professor James around including the, the conversation of justice. And then I have a question for, um, for, for you, for, for Rina, around, I'm curious about um, what it took at the beginning, because, I mean, you ran this for a few years, but I would expect that the first year was not really that successful. Oh, I, oh, I don't know, like, I don't, because uh, putting people together uh, from different sides of the, who very, very uh, opposing sides, um, there, there must have been a moment where things didn't go work out that well. So I'm, I'm curious about that experience, how, how you were able to capitalize on it. And, and I would imagine that at some point people actually left no liking each other yeah, also. Like, um, I don't know, so you can, you can tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Wonderful questions. I'm going to turn it over to James and have him respond. And then, Rena, when the moment comes, I'm sure there's a lot more we can learn from you as well. Can we go back on this? Uh, I want to respond to your comment about the justice, because unfortunately, it didn't show up. But if I draw your attention to this, this little area here, I do talk about three types of justice in terms of the conflict transformation. So number five, to punish offenses, which is the criminal punitive justice. Number six, 
repair harm, promote healing, which is restorative justice. And number seven, achieve greater equity in distribution of resources, which is distributive justice. So I do talk about three different types of justice. So the first one is about how you punish people who have committed crimes, violent acts. The second one is how you, and it relates to your story about how you, you know, people who've suffered so much trauma, how do you, you go about healing them, restoring them, you know, to be, you know, effective members of society. Because people very often in the context of warfare, you know, women are victimized twice. They suffer the trauma of the rape, then they suffer the trauma of the ostracization. This is what Judith Storer is all about. So the question, the issue of restorative justice is beyond the rehabilitation and resettlement. How do we, you know, promote healing in that society? So it's a good point to raise, and unfortunately, the, uh, it didn't show up. But let me respond to the earlier question you made about, um, about Africa. And uh, if I understood your question clearly, it's not clear to you how, by focusing on the diaspora, we are relating to the broader continental. Was that what you were asking? Well, there's two ways to answer that. One, the African Union, if you're aware, in 2005, basically officially recognized the African diaspora as Africa's fifth region. So we have North Africa, West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. Those are the four geographic regions. But in 2005, the African Union, which as you know is the main continental organization, officially established that we are gonna recognize the African diaspora worldwide as constituting Africa's fifth region. And it encourages various governments in Africa to establish formal mechanisms by which they can engage the diaspora. So that's part of what we are looking at. But the reality is that to the, you know, once we are focused on the diaspora, we are focusing at the local level in terms of civil society. And as much as I agree that we need to look at Africa as a whole, we must also realize the incredible diversity among Africa's 55. And I'm always critical of a one-size-fits-all policy, which is what the UN and the major donors, you know, have a, they have a formula for peace building. So whether it's Iraq, whether it's Uganda, whether it's Nepal, they don't care. It's a one-size-fits-all. But I think it's the differences that matter. Because every conflict has its own unique history, its own unique causes, and so on and so forth. And the idea is, and as much as I agree, the lady who made the point about the fragmentation, that it's not only within the diaspora, it's also potentially between the diaspora and people back home because there's a feeling that diaspora, by being away, are somewhat removed and have become somewhat privileged. But the idea is that we are aware of this. And to the extent that diaspora want to be engaged with their countries of origin, they must make the effort. You know, you're not going in there to tell people what to do, but you're going in there to listen and to contribute. Okay, so that's are my responses. And just give Rena a moment to briefly respond to Jorge's other question, and then we'll open it back up. Sure. Um, this whole question about success, it's, it's an interesting one because we, we struggle with how, how do we even measure success in, you know, in peace building projects. It's really a... It's not straightforward at all. I, I should have mentioned that one of our main um, funding sources this year for the first time is the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. So um, what we're, w with that grant, what we're testing in terms of success is, what, you know, the, the big thing we're trying to achieve is to increase the number of people engaged in peace building. And that, even that's hard to measure, but that's, that's the sort of the lofty goal. Um, you're absolutely right. We, we always, every year we get better at this. And, and I don't think we've ever had a year where people left not liking each other. The biggest challenge, and, and maybe Khalil wants to um, talk a little bit more about this, but the biggest challenge that is not so much how they feel at, right at the end of the program, because it's, it's always quite high and positive, it's how to maintain that, uh, that transformation when they go back home. Because that's, you know, they go back home and no one around them has gone through this program. <laughs> so that's, um, that's the, the biggest challenge, and of course, working with a, a this organization, Prime, which is a very extremely well-respected peace education organization, is a, an enormous opportunity for us so that they, they will work with the youth to continue to support them uh, when there's a crisis, when, when the conflict, um, uh, when, when, it, it, when wars happen, when uh, any sort of major violent uh, conflict erupts, and just keeping the momentum alive when there's so much pressure to not do this work um, everywhere they go. So I don't know if you want to say anything about yeah, that. You have to put your finger. I want to add just a uh, that's true. Uh, every beginning, uh, it have its own difficulties, actually. 
Uh, but we uh, emphasize uh, from the early beginning that uh, uh, people who is uh, going to engage in this uh, programs uh, should be b having an open mind. And this is the point I added in the first beginning for you, Joanna, if you remember. Uh, they should be open-minded, uh, this is one. And they, uh, we have a very simple rule that we should respect each other. Uh, otherwise, if we are enemies or not, respect is very important for us. So these two points is very important to start even from the early uh, beginning. And uh, one other, also always we have activities uh, for these recent uh, BLs or uh, uh, participants uh, who shares this year. Uh, we oriented them uh, in Palestine, in Israel. Uh, we have, for example, uh, each start we have a start. Uh, we have the previous filming. We ask the, uh, the new uh, participants to see these films and to show the, those films to others. And you will be uh, so amazed that uh, if you and, uh, uh, get the point that the film that they show most is chick point of humanity, for example. Which means, for my aspect, for, for my side, uh, for example, that uh, all the participants, most of them, or even all of them, they show this film, particularly this film, a Checkpoint of Humanity. All of them, they have the will to make a change. You see, the, the name of the film, Checkpoint of Humanity. And if you are aware of, about the checkpoints, the checkpoints mean that there are so many harms. There are so many difficulties. There are so many obstacles towards the other to pass it. So when uh, they show these films, Chick Points of Humanity, and we ask them to tell why, uh, they said, because we want the future to be more open and more uh, 